So today's webinar, we're talking about energy technologies. Um, probably I will speak for about half an hour um, or thereabouts and uh, people should feel free to ask questions as we go along. There's a Q&A function in Zoom, so that's the best option to use while I am uh, also sharing my um, screen, it flashes up. Um, hopefully you will find this journey through different energy technologies interesting uh, and stimulating and um, it's really based on the fundamentals. So what are the key technologies that uh, we are moving away from? What are we moving to? Uh, and what are the key considerations and how do these work? So it's back to first principles really um, uh, to give everyone uh, who's interested in community energy and moving to 100% renewables a grounding in understanding those technologies. So that's, that's what we're trying to do today. So let's get started. Let me share my screen. So, Intro to the Energy System, uh, webinar three on energy technologies. So in this webinar, we're going to talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly of energy technologies. So let's get started. Um, wind. Wind technology has been one of the most uh, exciting uh, and innovative clean energy technologies and has really helped change the landscape um, and um, helped uh, people think that renewable technologies were possibly a force that could power the world, uh, if not their town or their country. Um, so wind technology, when we think of wind energy, uh, you know, there's actually, we've been using wind energy as humans for millennia. We've used it to dry our clothes, we've used it to cross oceans. Um, and now we're, we used it to crush grain and now we're using it to generate electricity. Um, the majority of uh, modern wind turbines are three-bladed wind turbines um, and they have a few key parts. So they have a tower um, with a big concrete foundation sitting underneath it. Um, then they have the blades, three blades. And then there is a nacelle, and within the nacelle uh, either sits a direct drive or a gearbox, which um, rotates and, and creates um, rotational momentum and, and then electricity. So that's you know the basics of it. Um, I think uh, I love wind turbines. I think they're majestic and beautiful. Um, uh, and I think that the technology is a really elegant one because the way wind technology really works is based on uh, the same way, the same physics as uh, the way an aeroplane works. So if you think about an aeroplane wing, it's shaped in a curved manner, like a, what's technically called an aerofoil. Um, and what that means is it splits the air and the air on top um, uh, goes more slowly than the air underneath that creates an area of low pressure causing what we call lift and that's exactly what the air, the um, happens with a wind turbine blade um, on one side of the wind turbine blade there's a area of lower pressure causing the the blade to to lift up um, and rotate uh, and it's a quite an efficient and effective form of harnessing uh, the wind energy. Sorry for flicking through slides there. Um, in fact, there's a cubic relationship. Uh, for every mm, two metres per second, you increase the wind speed, you increase the energy output eightfold. So there's really quite a powerful relationship between uh, uh, increasing the wind speed and uh, and the electricity generation, which is why um, you actually want a really good wind resource and why the majority of wind turbines are located in really specific locations um, in, across Australia and around the world. Um, if you think about wind farms, you can tend to think of them located like uh, the one I'm in uh, off the shore of, um, of uh, Denmark in Middle Grindon. Uh, so offshore wind farms are a big thing globally. Um, in Australia, we see a lot of uh, wind turbines uh, in coastal areas getting a nice sea breeze. Um, and then also in high areas like uh, the New England Tablelands or the Atherton Tablelands, and particularly on a ridge line. So the air flows up the ridge and speeds up. Um, 
when you are uh, harnessing the energy of the wind, you want a good quality, not just a good speed, but a good quality of wind. And so we talk about laminar flow and turbulent flow. Laminar is really smooth um, and turbulent is really chaotic. There's not a lot of energy in chaotic, turbulent wind. And so uh, in cities uh, or forests, uh, the, you know, trees and buildings kick up a lot of turbulence uh, and that means that there's not a good, not much energy to then harness. So that's why you see majority of wind turbines um, not in those locations because you want to make sure that the air is smooth flowing and flowing fast um, so you can really easily um, harness it. So you know, that's sort of the basic physics of how, how wind turbines work. Um, one of the interesting things about wind turbines is that they're highly modular. Um, they started off, um, really the modern wind industry grew out of Denmark in the late 70s and early 80s. In fact, one of the first modern day wind turbines, a 900 kilowatt turbine, was literally built by a community. I recommend you go and look up uh, the community and the, and the wind turbine of Tvinvind. T-V-I-N-W-I-N-D, I'm pretty sure, something like that. Uh, in Denmark, um, people built the foundations, poured the concrete, laid the steel rods, designed the blades. You know, it was a real community effort of about 700 people. Quite an exciting story um, back in the late 70s, early 80s. And then really it exploded from there. So most of the turbines started off quite small and then they scaled up. And now um, on the bottom uh, right-hand corner, you'll see me standing in front of a very big, fat wind turbine. That was a five megawatt wind turbine uh, in central Germany. At the time, it was one of the largest in the world. Now we're up to eight, 10, even 12 megawatt wind turbines, and they're talking about 20 and 50 megawatt turbines in offshore farms or off Germany and, and uh, in the North Sea in Denmark and places like that. So you know, we've got very small little turbines all the way up to you know, these really big monster turbines. Uh, and lots of um, ability to scale. And, and one of the things about having a modular technology where you have lots of turbines rather than just one big generator, like a 350 megawatt coal generator, is it helps bring down the cost much more quickly. So you've seen wind technology was for a long time one of the cheapest new builds of renewable energy technology. Um, it's now cost competitive and cheaper than building new coal and new gas. Uh, and it's played a very important role in Australia's uh, transition to renewables so far. Um, it was when the renewable energy target was uh, instigated in 2001, um, that really drove a lot of wind development, particularly in places like South Australia, where the wind resource was the best. Um, you know, the, the flow of air um, coming off the Great Australian Bight is you know, some of the best wind resources around the world. And the other great thing about a modular technology is that you can have a wind farm that's one turbine or you can have a wind farm that's 500 turbines. And so what we've seen is in community-owned renewables projects like Hepburn Wind, which is the top right-hand corner, you've got um, wind farms with just two turbines. So that is either Gusto or Gale, one of the two Hepburn Wind turbines. Um, so hopefully that gives you a bit of an overview of wind as a starting introduction to energy technologies and let's move on to solar. Um, any questions before I go on? All right, let's move on to solar PV. So, solar PV is one of those miraculous feats of chemistry. Uh, it uses, you know, quite sophisticated um, silicon at the moment, but other, um, um, other base chemical or element um, panels or um, cells uh, to when um, sunlight hits them, they're activated, generating a flow of current, creating electricity. That's sort of the bastardized version. Um, you know, and this was a technology that was really uh, built and, and investigated uh, for space travel. So solar energy was used to, to help power the, our space stations. And that meant it was a highly niche, very expensive technology. And some engineers in Germany back in the 90s um, saw the real potential of it. They went 
This is a technology ge that generates electricity without any moving parts. Yes, the inverters and other things have some moving parts, but the, the panels themselves don't have any moving parts. That means if they don't have any moving parts, they break down less often. If we could drive them down the cost curve from you know, $1,000 a watt down to something affordable, then that could really revolutionise things. And that's exactly what's happened. And because these solar cells are modular, even more modular than, than uh, wind turbines, it's meant that you can even drive down the cost of solar in much greater rates, much more like computer chips and mobile phones than like, uh, than like wind turbines even. Um, and because it's modular, solar power now powers uh, one single lamp in households in Africa or uh, our mobile phone charger when we go camping. Uh, it powers our house, um, parts of our household needs and factory needs, and then we can scale it up to hundreds of megawatts solar farms, uh, like some of the ones that we've seen. I think this one is Ningen out near Broken Hill. And you can do it rooftop, you can do it in a farm, you can do it in an appliance. You know, the, the amount of uh, applications of solar technology and solar PV particularly is quite exciting and is really transformative. Uh, we're seeing, for example, more talk around building integrated um, solar PV. So Tesla is proposing their, their rooftop solar tiles. Um, building integrated PV is something that's uh, an idea that's been around for a long time. Um, it's happened to greater or lesser extents. If you go to the Centre for Appropriate Technology in Wales, they've got a lovely solar roof. Um, However, in Australia, some of the, my engineering friends suggest that it's actually not that efficient to do building integrated PV. Um, so solar panels become less efficient over time. Um, they also come, become less efficient uh, when uh, they're dirty and they also become less efficient when they're hot, which is a little bit of a catch-22. So what you want to ensure is that there's a flow of air underneath and above the solar panel where the solar is in really heat heated places and that's why building integrated PV and having tiles may not be more that particularly efficient in the Australian context because just think about how hot your roof cavity gets um, on a summer afternoon that underside of that solar cell will be really warm whereas if it's just on the roof um, there's still some air flowing in and around it. Uh, so that's sort of some thinking around where PV is going, solar PV is going. Uh, it, stands for sort of solar photovoltaics. Um, at the moment, the main chemistry is silicon, but there's a range of new uh, iterations and chemistries on the horizon, things like perovskites. Uh, there's also printed solar. One of the things around solar and really energy technology, any energy technology, is the question of efficiency. Um, so, uh, you know, you want to get efficient uh, solar panels. That means for every unit of energy of sunlight that falls on the solar panel, you want to, um, to convert as much as that into electricity as you can. And typically solar panels have been in the sort of 10, 12, 13, 15 percent efficient range. Um, in the University of New South Wales has for a long time held some of the... the um, the world records for the most efficient solar cells and they're getting up into the 20, you know, high 20% efficiencies. So we're getting more efficient in our solar cells. But the thing is, the more efficient you get, often the more expensive you get. So you've got to find a trade-off between, um, you know, having affordable solar panels that are sufficiently efficient that they'll also pay themselves back. You know, that's, you know, that, that's standard engineering uh, design when you think about those two trade-offs. But, you know, one of the, the promises that we've heard a lot about is printable solar panels, where you, you print um, you know, quite uh, low-efficiency solar cells but um, onto material and you turn it into backpacks or, or whatever, or curtains, uh, and they're low-efficiency but they're so cheap that you're still getting some good electricity and it's quite cost-effective. So, you know, there, there's a whole range of um, technologies happening. I, you know, with solar and wind, you know, they're both mature, well-established technologies. 
um, they will form, you know, for the next many years, the bulk or, or it will increasingly become the bulk of our energy needs um, or provide the bulk of our electricity needs. Uh, we're not there yet, obviously. We're still only um, you know, at 14 or 15% renewables in Australia, but we're, go we're headed that way. Uh, and the reason I bring that up is, you know, there is significant research and development still happening around solar technologies, things like perovskites and things like that. Um, and that will be good. And who knows what the nev next revolution will be around solar technologies, but uh, we don't actually need it. You know, that's not to say we shouldn't stop doing it, but we also have very good quality solar technology right now. Okay, I'm going to keep moving on. We've talked about solar PV. Let's talk about concentrating solar thermal. That's basically where you use mirrors to concentrate sunlight on a single point or a single line. Um, at that point or line uh, is a fluid that gets superheated uh, and is used to turn a steam turbine. Or in the case, or you can also use it, um, the heat to melt salt um, and store that heat that can then be used to drive a steam turbine at later times, say when it's night time. So that's the basis of concentrating solar thermal. We basically see, you know, these power towers or central point ones, and that's what we'll see in Australia's first big concentrating solar thermal plant in Port Augusta, uh, which has been a, a long time campaign coming um, and was announced by uh, the South Australian government that they're proceeding with that. Uh, and I think some people have been employed to start making that become a reality in Port Augusta in South Australia. So that's one form of concentrating solar thermal. Then you have um, uh, trough ones, like the, the left-hand side photo, and then there's also something called linear Fresnel. Uh, so a few different you know, examples of that. Um, concentrating solar thermal is quite uh, valuable because it is uh, on demand, it's a rapid response technology, it can turn on and off very quickly, and can, so can really fill the gaps of, uh, of you know, wind and solar, uh, solar PV, and also because you can combine it with this molten salt storage, you can also uh, store uh, energy as well. And, and thermal storage is typically more efficient than electrical storage, so you know, that has some, some strengths as well. Let's keep going. Um, any questions? Okay, keep on going. So the good, sustainable bioenergy, and I, I really emphasize the sustainable here. Bioenergy is one of those technologies. In fact, it's not just one technology, it's multiple technologies. Um, if you use the wrong feedstock, the right, wrong biomass resource, like say native old growth forest, it's terrible, you know, for ecological outcomes and for emission outcomes. But if you use, say food waste or human waste or crop waste or you, you know, a range of other different types of feedstocks that are waste streams to convert that into fertilizer um, and methane that then the methane generated which typically things you know it's it's basically what happens in your compost uh, things decompose they generate um, methane that methane can then be burnt um, and uh, you know, generate uh, oh, you know, heat and then electricity. So that sort of you know, typical thermal cycle process uh, can be used but powered from a biofuel and not a fuel but a, a biogas resource, so sustainable bioenergy. And that's happening a lot in Europe. Um, I visited uh, Yunda, Germany's first bioenergy village. They had a, um, it was a com community cooperatively owned um, bioenergy facility. It was 700 kilowatts of heat that was then used to pump, uh, to heat all of that, uh, most of the households in the village. And then there was a 700 kilowatt um, little electric generator and that powered more than the whole village needed. So you know, there's some great examples that are really quite sustainable and then there are some really problematic examples. In Australia, bioenergy hasn't really gotten off the ground particularly. We have some large bagasse, uh, so sugarcane based bioenergy plants. Um, yeah. 
I won't pass judgment on whether they're a good or a bad thing. Um, they've got some pros and cons about them. But one thing that I would say is that we tend to go big on bioenergy, whereas I think bioenergy has a natural economy of scale. You know, it can't be too small because the equipment is very expensive and you need people to run it. Um, but it can't be too big because you need to bring in enough feedstock, enough biomass um, from the surrounding area. And if you're trucking it from hundreds of kilometres away, A, that's bad for the environment in terms of fuel costs, but it's also it's you know, bad monetarily and kills the business model. So there's you know, this interesting community scale around bioenergy that if we could crack the nut and really make it um, driven by communities for communities, uh, it could work really well, but we need to make sure that it doesn't go the other way where you're burning native old growth forests in big coal fired power stations, which is what has happened and we don't want that. That is a very bad technology. Um, one of the other things around sustainable bioenergy is it also, it does generate not just uh, electricity, but heat and uh, Heat is actually a very valuable commodity um, for our industries. Um, you know, Decarbonising our industries is one of the biggest challenges that we will face. Um, and so technologies like concentrating solar thermal and sustainable bioenergy play a really important role in that. I will also... Uh, nope, lost that train of thought. So let's keep going. Um, the good, storage technologies, and there's a few different types of that. So uh, everyone, I think, will have heard of Snowy 2.0, pumped hydro. We have some pumped hydro all already in Australia, in the Shoalhaven. Um, there's a nice pumped hydro plant. And basically what that is, is that you know, just like in a normal hydro plant, you have a dam at the top um, or a reservoir, and then water flows down the hill driving a hydro a turbine generating electricity um, in a pumped hydro situation you also have a reservoir or a water source at the bottom of the hill and it gets pumped up into the top reservoir at times of say a lot of wind generation or traditionally in australia at times when coal-fired power stations were really cheap overnight um, so pumped hydro can turn on really quickly so it's, it's very good rapid response technology um, it's quite capital intensive um, you know, you need to do it in appropriate locations. So you've got, you know, you're not affecting the ecology and uh, you've got a good water resource um, and it's not interrupting, you know, natural flows too much. But it is, you know, a technology that, um, that shows a lot of merit, a lot of promise. And there are, I think, about five or six community energy groups that currently investigating community pumped hydro. So that's pretty exciting. Then, of course, there's batteries. I think everyone knows about a Tesla power wall, which uses lithium iron, but the battery on the right is actually one that uses seawater. So there's a whole bunch of different chemistries around battery storage. And there's also a whole bunch of different scales from, you know, we use it in our phones uh, all the way up to households and then the massive 100 megawatt uh, grid big battery that's turning on this week in South Australia, the biggest in the world. You know, so storage technologies will play a really important role uh, in uh, balancing energy demand and filling in the gaps, particularly overnight. Um, uh, but, you know, there are some cautions, you know, some of the chemistries around um, battery storage are, are pretty toxic, so we need to be careful about them uh, and we need to put in place good safety standards and we also need to put in place good stewardship and recycling programs and um, reuse programs so that the, um, the chemicals involved in batteries get used at the end of the, um, you know, get recovered at the end of the life. Um, so, you know, I know that the Institute for Sustainable Futures and a number of governments are looking at that now, but that's something that we need to be aware of as um, renewable energy advocates. So that storage um, plays an important role, is very exciting right now. Also, you know, given storage technologies, particularly, you know, say the Tesla is, the Tesla Powerwall is very modular. It's on a similar cost curve trajectory to solar PV, so coming down very rapidly. Uh, and, you know, Elon Musk says, you know, it's the same batteries in a car versus an, and a power wall and the big 100 megawatt batteries. So they really are scalable. So it's really quite interesting. Let's keep going. Oh, I will say one thing. Um, 
most home battery storage systems going in at the moment are what we call dumb systems. They're, they're not uh, smart grid enabled. They don't have communications technologies that means that they can, they can be uh, used when the grid most needs it. I think that this is a bit of a problem and we need to be thinking about how we can not just install uh, battery technologies for our, our own household use, but also how we can ensure that the technologies we install uh, at a household scale and a community scale um, benefit the wider community and the wider energy system. The good small hydro. So I'm talking about run of the river systems. This one is in the UK. Uh, behind that wall on that photo is a big, what we call Archimedes screw, reverse Archimedes screw. It's a big lot of iron and water flows down it, um, pushes it, turns it, um, and that then drives a generator. It, it generates about 70 kilowatts of uh, power and it is used to power the local cooperative shop up the, up the escarpment from, from where that photo is taken. There's a lot of small hydro happening around the world. In Australia, less so, but it is somewhere where there's water uh, and there's you know, reasonably big hills. Uh, that there's a lot of opportunity and potential uh, around small hydro. Um, and there's a number of different te technologies. Um, uh, you know, this uh, Archimedes screw is, is good for um, small drops, but you know, you'll get more energy output with a larger drop. Um, yeah, so it's, it's um, and you, know, you need to be aware of the potential ecological impacts, but um, things like putting in fish ladders and, and grates and other things um, can really minimise that and actually end up being quite a, um, a, a net positive outcome for, for the ecology. The good marine energy, marine, there is so much power in our, in water. Uh, you know, it's much denser than air. Um, that means it, it pushes things harder. Um, but the energy in our waves and our tides is both a blessing and a curse. It is um, a blessing because if we can harness it, we've got abundant uh, renewable resources, renewable electricity. Uh, however, the curse is at some times during storms that energy is too much for most technologies to handle. So marine energy is, is a great concept and there's lots of research and development going on around it. Carnegie Wave out over in Fremantle, I think, uh, certainly in Western Australia, um, has got a pilot project um, and it seems to be going very well. Um, but it's not a nut that has been cracked commercially around the world yet. Um, there's huge potential, but we need to be able to create technologies that can also with, not just withstand everyday tides and waves, but also really big storm events. Also, you know, the ocean underneath it is quite inhospitable. You know, the, the, it's quite corrosive and there's a whole range of other things. So, you know, it, it's a difficult environment to work in, but, you know, there's a lot of potential around marine energy. Um, you know, I do have to recognise some of the ecological impacts, like the Seven Barrage, which was an idea in, in the UK, which is a tidal barrage, you know, big tide move, tidal movements. That could have had, that could have some potential you know, if you locate these in bad places, they can have impacts on the local ecology. Um, however, if you locate them in other places, they can actually become a source for, for, for creating new ecologies. So, you know, there's swings and roundabouts, and I think it's important to take a nuanced approach um, when you're getting into the detail of, of thinking about different, the, the roles of different energy technologies. So that's the good, final good, um, energy management and energy efficiency technologies. So I'm talking about smart meters, in-home displays, apps, insulation, efficient appliances, um, smart appliances. These will all re play a really important role because in a renewable powered future, our demand will be as dynamic as our supply. And it, you know, it will be great if we can um, send a signal to charge our battery when the wind is blowing the most and there's more electricity than is needed. So that's the kind of smart enabled. And when I say smart, what I really mean is it has software and internet communication technologies attached to it. Um, 
And you know, energy efficiency, the, the cheapest energy is the energy we don't use. So we could use energy a lot more efficiently and productively here in Australia, but in our homes, uh, in our businesses and in our industry and in our transport sector as well. So you know, lots of opportunities here and one we too often forget. So that's good, let's talk about bad. Um, gas, uh, gas is a fossil fuel the fossil form of gas. Um, typically, it's come from large underground reserves uh, off the co south coast of Australia. Um, increasingly, it's starting to come from uh, unconventional locations, uh, locations such as coal seam gas fields that are having really big impacts on the water table uh, and farmland um, and are leaking a lot of methane. Um, so gas gas basically methane is, is 25 times more potent as a greenhouse gas than uh, carbon dioxide uh, so if you have leakage of methane which you will um, and our gas infrastructure in Australia is is pretty old um, you know that's that's a really big problem from a climate change perspective um, gas has traditionally played uh, a peaking role in Australia's energy system it's um, uh, when we have peak demands on a cold winter's morning or a hot summer afternoon, gas turns on um, quickly. Uh, that's typically the role it's played, but uh, I think uh, slightly more nuanced is that there are really two types of gas turbines that we use in Australia. There's open cycle gas turbines that are these pe peaking plants and then closed circle gas turbines, which act more as a base load power um, option. So that means um, they run much more of the time. Uh, gas prices are going up. Our gas uh, market is now linked to the international price and we um, have committed, our gas companies have committed to export more than is actually uh, good for Australia. So that means our gas prices are going up. Um, that affects us as households if we use gas for cooking and heating, um, but it also affects us in our electricity bills because we're now more reliant on gas because we've had nine coal-fired power stations shut down, um, but that means we're using gas which is more expensive and even more expensive right now more of the time, which means there's a greater cost to all of us. So some you know, big issues around gas uh, from a from a climate change perspective, from a cost perspective, um, I think you know gas is play, going to play. You know, um, there is one gas-fired power station being built at the moment, and a few proposed. Um, that's a problem. But that said, we probably uh, you know don't want our gas-fired power stations to shut down urgently because we need them to for energy security reasons. Uh, and certainly we'll continue to do that so until we keep we can bring enough uh, enough um, demand management battery storage and concentrating solar thermal and, and sustainable bioenergy on board so you know, those are the types of technologies that we will see um, replace gas any questions on the Q&A function before I keep going okay the bad. Yes, there is a bad renewable energy technology and that is something called a vertical access wind turbine. You probably will have seen these uh, on uh, building roofs uh, or on Facebook. Uh, they're, you know, whirly gig kinesthetic art, in my opinion. Um, and it's not just my opinion, it's you know, based on the laws of phys physics. Typically, vertical axis wind turbines have been put on uh, buildings by organisations that say that want to show their climate credentials. They want to say we're going to renewable energy. Unfortunately, they've been duped because typically a vertical axis wind turbine won't pay back the energy that was used to make it. They're highly inefficient, they're wrought, and they distract from the real solutions. Uh, so you know, these spinny things, whirly gigs, um, part of them is always pushing against the wind. So they will never be as efficient as a horizontal access wind turbine. Also, when you see people advertising these, uh, you will see them saying, oh, they work in low wind and turbulent environments. There's not any energy in a low wind or turbulent environment. So how can you harness 
much energy from a wind where there isn't much energy. So you know, they're just a bad idea. Um, please don't promote them. Please don't look at them there. And you know, if you want to find out more, uh, the Alternative Technology Association and the Institute for Sustainable Futures uh, used to run uh, a small windside assessment program or training course um, that I completed about five years ago. And uh, you know, there's some really good literature around how you know, these turbines are really inefficient, basically. So that's the bad, the bad big hydro. We have you know, a fair amount of big hydro. I'm actually in Tasmania right now, so lots of big hydro here. You know, there's some fairly large ecological impacts and also climate impacts when you flood whole valleys. Uh, you, know, you have trees that decompose and generate methane and um, you also flood whole valleys and that affects the ecology significantly. Uh, so really, we don't want to build any more big hydro plants and we shouldn't be pushing other countries to build big hydro plants because you know, they're an old form of renewables technology. However, the hydro that we do have, we should keep. You know, and upgrading it to include, uh, you know, pumped hydro makes sense to me. Um, so, you know, large hydro schemes with big hydroelectric dams, really, you know, the renewables of the, the 60s and 70s and the 50s, not something that we want to be pursuing in the modern era, but maintaining what we have will help us get to 100% renewables much more easily. And it's a good balancing technology as well. It, it, it turns on and off um, very quickly. So, uh, yeah, and how it works, water flows downhill, drives a turbine, generating electricity. It's pretty straightforward. Keeping on moving on. So the ugly, I've talked about the good, the bad, the ugly. Two ugly technologies, coal. Australia has traditionally been 85% reliant on coal electricity uh, for our electricity needs. Um, we have a number of very large coal-fired power stations. We used to have 29, we now have 20 and with Muja Power Station in Western Australia shutting down in the next few months, uh, we'll soon have 19. Uh, coal works, you burn coal in a, boil, uh, a, in a furnace, that heats a boiler, that boiler generates steam and that steam is used to drive uh, an electricity, electric turbine. In this photo, there's actually four different units. So each of those sort of square um, units is, is a different um, boiler, furnace, generator set. Um, those big concrete towers with a lot of um, white stuff coming out of it, that's actually the cooling towers because you need to you know, you use a lot of water when you're using generating electricity using this kind of thermal process. Um, and it's the tall chimneys that are actually the, the, um, where the carbon dioxide and other toxic pollutants come out the stack. Um, yeah, it's a technology that works more efficiently when it uh, is going all of the time. It can't ramp up and down very easily. Um, and that's where the term baseload comes from. It's a term to apply to, to plants like thermal plants, like coal-fired power stations that, that couldn't turn on and off quickly and so you wanted them to run all the time. And what that means is then, well, electricity demand, when we use electricity is much more dynamic than just running a coal-fired power station full tilt most of the time. So uh, that's where we got things like um, off-peak hot water, where people encouraged, uh, you know, the electricity industry encouraged you to use electricity overnight by heating your hot water. And that meant that they could soak up the electricity um, generated by the baseload power stations, um, like coal-fired power stations, and uh, means they didn't have to ramp down, which would be you know, bad for both their profits and also for their um, for the efficiency of the plant. And also more emissions intensive when they're less... Uh, um, efficient as well. So that's why actually coal is not compatible with technologies like wind and solar where you know they cut an in and out quite quickly and you need to be able to ramp up and ramp down quite quickly. So 
you know, that's coal. Uh, it's the most emissions intensive technology, energy technology that we have. Uh, that's why it's ugly. Um, so final, ugly, nuclear. Um, some environmentalists like nuclear. Um, I'm not quite sure why, given that it's toxic from start to finish. Um, uranium mines are pretty unpleasant places. Uh, and then, uh, you know, you take them, you ship them to nuclear reactors. Um, and basically how a nuclear reactor works is there's a nuclear reaction that generates heat. Then that heat uh, is used to um, create steam and that steam drives a boiler, uh, a, 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 a generator. So very similar to coal, but instead of burning coal, you've got a, you're using uranium to create a nuclear reactor reaction. So different thermal process, but after that, it's pretty much the same. Um, nuclear is, and then there's the waste, which we still haven't found a safe way to process it. Um, and then the fact it's, it's expensive and, you know, humans are fall fallible, so that there also are risks of, um, you know, accidents. Uh, Germany uh, has traditionally relied a lot on nuclear power. They are getting out of it by 2020. Japan, uh, after the Fukushima accident, um, is get also on a trajectory out of nuclear power. In France, nuclear power stations are now getting old, um, and so we're going to need replacing. Um, in so there are the, other than China, the main places that nuclear power plants are being built around the world. There's one, Hinkley C in the UK, there's one in Finland, and there's a few in the US. Uh, the ones in the US, about two of them have been cancelled in the last six months. Uh, the Finnish one is about 10 years over schedule, and I don't remember how much over budget. Um, the Hinkley C one has got a power purchase agreement with the government to pay, I think, 28 or 30 pence a kilowatt hour. We're talking pence here, so we'll double it to get Australian cents. So we're talking about 60 cents a kilowatt hour for the new nuclear power station. And that doesn't really even cover the decommissioning costs of you know, a very large and toxic um, piece of infrastructure. So uh, expensive, costly, oh, well, costly and expensive are the same thing, has environmental impacts, really expensive, not really needed. And I, if you're interested in finding out more, I, I would Google uh, Toshiba um, and Westinghouse and um, look at what their nuclear division might mean for, you know, Toshiba, the company that, you know, some of us buy computers from. Um, there's threat, yeah, there's concern that they might go bankrupt due to the inability to get nuclear working. Um, so, yeah. Just don't do it. We don't have nuclear in Australia. It's illegal to build a nuclear power station in Australia. We should just not go there. Uh, so what is the time? It's, oh, I've been talking for quite a long time. Let me just finish by two, the last um, couple of slides. Oh, there's a chat. Question. Is there any way of using old coal mines for any renewables? So that's a really good question, Marianne. Um, uh, with old coal mines, um, well, in northern Queensland at the moment, there is a, an old gold mine where they're putting a solar array um, next to the gold mine, and then they're going to use, they're going to flood part of the gold mine, and they're going to pump up uh, the uh, use the the gold mine as a, a reservoir for pumped uh, hydro storage. Uh, along with a solar farm next to it. So, you know, that's a, something that can be done and a way to create renewables from mines. I was down in the Latrobe Valley uh, a year and a bit ago and one of the guys down there was telling me, you know, people have been thinking about doing that similar idea with the mines in the Latrobe Valley. The issue is that the amount of particulates there are in gold mine, uh, in um in coal mines is much greater than in gold mines. And those particulates then clog up the pipes and the pumps and so make it much uh, more uh, expensive to keep those pumps maintained and working. Um, so there's some, you know, concepts around it and a lot of people are interested in it. Um, 
there are some challenges around it and uh, people who know more than me say it's pretty unlikely but that doesn't mean it's not impossible um so yeah uh, i hope that sort of answers your question there um i will just finish with two last slides but keep uh, asking more questions and i'll answer them as they go along um, so geography of coal generation, you know, traditionally our coal, you know, coal which has formed 85% of our electricity needs um, until recently, is located in about five geographies around the, the country. So, you know, there's over in Western Australia, Southwest Western Australia, um, there's the Hunter Valley in Victoria, there's uh, no, the Hunter Valley in New South Wales, the, the Trobe Valley in Victoria, um, then sort of Tarong and Gladstone. And there are clusters of these coal-fired power stations and they're located they're close to where the coal mines are, either right next door or very close by. Um, then typically need to be close to a water source um, so that you can cool it. Um, and then you just build big transmission lines to those few large coal-fired power stations. Um, so, uh, wait a second, question coming up. Ah, good question. I will answer that in a second, Marianne. Um, just to finish on, uh, on coal-fired power stations, um, you know, I, I, you know, and I think we all know this, but because, you know, we are in a transition towards renewable energy, that means... You know, that some places are going to be more affected than others. And um, we should be thinking about how do we utilise the amazing know-how and grid infrastructure that exists in those places. And so, you know, grid-based, you know, large batteries and those types of things. And then one proposal from Marianne just now was floating solar panels. Um, we are seeing uh, Australia's second so floating solar farm, or maybe it's its first, um, being built on the Lismore sewage treatment plant works. Uh, yeah, I reckon if you flooded mines and then you floated some solar panels on the top, that would be a great opportunity. Um, you know, you can also use them for recreation and a whole range of other things. But uh, yeah, certainly, certainly potential for sol floating solar farms. Um, it's a thing, it's happening around the world. Um, uh, and uh, you yeah, I think there's not much more to be said. Um, just final slide is, you know, what's the geography of renewables? Well, solar you can pretty much put anywhere. Um, hydro is more specific, but, you know, the recent report by ANU found that pump, you know, there were hundreds of different potential sites for pumped hydro. Uh, wind, we mainly see it across the south, across the bight. Um, and then in the higher elevation areas, so up, you know, in the tablelands and the ranges, um, those are the main areas. There's bioenergy where there's, you know, good biomass resources, so particularly on the coast, um, around the northern rivers, um, northern Queensland, central Victoria. Uh, and then, you know, wave and water is all around the country, all around the coastal areas. Uh, and then geothermal, I haven't talked about geothermal. Um, I'm happy to answer questions on it, but I think I might finish up there. Are there any final questions? Well, I hope that you found this a useful and informative uh, overview of the different energy, main energy technologies out there, uh, the good, the bad and the ugly. Um, you know, I haven't talked about more of the software type technologies like blockchain and things like that, but there's huge amounts of innovation uh, happening. Um, thank you, Marianne. Thank you, everyone else for attending. Um, I yeah, hope it was useful and I look forward um, to our final webinar on Intro to the Energy System next week, which is about how do we get to 100% renewables? Um, what does that look like? Uh, and then there are a couple more webinars in the series after that. I hope, oh, one more question. Oh, thanks. Um, uh, uh, have a great evening. Enjoy your night.